Amen. So if, if you could come forward to speak to us, uh, please open your heart and receive God's word. God bless you in Jesus' name. Hello, church. It's a beautiful day. Are you happy to be in the house of God? Hallelujah. If you are happy to be in the house of God, say hallelujah. 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 Is the psalm is still said. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Let us go to the house of the Lord. We are here today. We need to be grateful to God because there are many people out there who does not see feel it appropriate to be in the house of the Lord. But we have decided to come here today to worship the Lord. And it is a great joy and for the fact that you have taken time off to come to be in the presence of the Lord, you will surely be remembered. Amen. God will surely bless you for that. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. I want to thank God Almighty before thanking Pastor Paul for the privilege given to me to stand here by the pulpit. I do not take that privilege for granted. I am humbled by it. I'm truly humbled by it. My prayer this morning is for the Holy Spirit to minister to every one of us here. And those at the sound of my voice to receive what God has for them today in this message. In Jesus' name. Amen. The higher place is where undiluted word of God is preached. An undiluted word of God is preached here. That much I know. And every one of you who have listened to the preachings at the higher place will attest the fact that we preach on the diluted word of God. In the past three weeks or so, four weeks, you know, three weeks, we have been examining heroic characters in the Bible. The first week, we looked into the character of Joseph. The second week, we looked into Jabez. And the third week, we looked into Joshua. Today, we are going to look into a character who, who was taken Whose parents, they were born, this character was born to a captive, a family that were in captivity in Babylon. The Hebrews, the Jews, the Israelites, they were in captivity in Israel, in Babylon, because they had sinned against God. They had deviated from the way of God. They have walked after their own desires. As God promised, if you walk with me, you will be at peace. But if you choose to go astray and decide to do your own thing, I will turn my back away from you. As a result, the Babylonian attacked Israel. And these people of Israel were taken into captivity. While they were in capti captivity, I'm sure they remember their times in Israel, in Jerusalem. I guess one of them, or these people were probably those who sang the song. Why should I come to a strange land to sing the Lord's song? So some of them were very sad, very saddened by the experience of being in captivity in Israel, in Babylon. And of course, they remember the 
things that they enjoyed, the, 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 the defense they had, the food, the love, the care, everything they had, they, they, they remembered them and regretted. Some of them did regret. And at this time, there were this couple, young couple, who despite all they were going through, all the pain, all the agony, had time to have a kiss or two. And of course, in the process of kissing and uh, you know, having some fun, something happened. Someone invited guests came in and disrupted them. But in the meantime, they'd be praying, asking God to please help them. And they'd be praying for God to send comfort to them. And of course, pray for God's comfort. And this young man came along. And this young man was under the tutelage of his parents, his family. He was told stories about what Israel was like, what Jerusalem was like, how beautiful it was, how peaceful, how much freedom they enjoyed compared to what they were suffering in Babylon. And this child grew, see the parents talking about, so passionately about this ancestral country of theirs. This land God has promised and given to them. He heard them talking about it. And he saw them praying, praying with such passion for peace, for Jerusalem to come back, return to their God, the Almighty God. And of course, this child grew to fall in love. Now became very passionate about Jerusalem. Became very, you know, proud and loved this nation of, of his ancestors. And fell in love. And will do anything, will commune, will meditate on the word. He read the word. He, he learned about everything. How Moses brought them from, East, from, Jerusalem, from Egypt into the promised land and all they enjoyed. So this boy stood in the world and fell in love with his ancestral land, in love with his father's God, the God, the heaven's God. And of course, he became, because of his love and the way he walked, had to study the word and meditate and be in the presence of the Lord, he gained favor and love of, ma of God and of man. So much so that he became an official in the king's palace. My biblical hero today that I'm talking about is the person of Nehemiah. Nehemiah. Nehemiah, what does Nehemiah mean? The name Nehemiah actually means Yahweh comforts. Jehovah comforts. So I can imagine when this child came along and the parents noticed when they were having fun and the boy came along, they said, ah, well, this is God's comfort. Yahweh comforts. So Nehemiah was became an official, a cup bearer to the king. A cup bearer is one who tests the drink, the wine the king will drink. This is to ensure, make sure that anything the king eats or drinks does not harm him. So that was a very important position that Nehemiah was privileged to occupy. So I would like us to turn to Nehemiah 1, and we can start reading. Nehemiah 1. I'll read. The word of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men 
and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile back in the province. That had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. Then said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the, in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jer Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. This is a young man who has never been to Jerusalem, who has never been to Israel. So I wonder, why would he be so disturbed when he heard about the, 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 the destruction, the disgrace his people or the people of Israel then were suffering? Because he's never been there. It is the passion that he has developed for his ancestral land the way his parents have tutored him about God and the promises God had promised them and how they had fallen away from the grace. That reminds me how important it is that we should learn, we should try at this age, as however young your child is, teach them the things of God, teach them the way of God. In so doing, they will grow to an extent where no matter where they go, they can never be far from it. So the love, the, 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 the tutoring of his parents gave him this great love for the land of Jerusalem, the city of God. And we jump to the next one. When he heard this, he was so saddened by it. He wept, he sobbed. Not when he got this message. He got this message at the month, the month of Kislev. That month of Kislev is about March. Then, Jeremiah went into prayer, started praying. He said, I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. He's a young man. So he knew about everything, how God had given Moses the law, the commandments. So this is a young man who, hearing this, felt the urge that even this thing that is happening in my father's land, in our land, it is not just those that sin against him. Even me, the things I have done, or the things I am doing, my behavior, my character, could be affecting the disgrace, the shame my people are suffering in Israel. That reminds me that whatever we do, we could our behavior will impact on us negatively or positively. So whenever we should check ourselves as often as possible, how is it, um, how am I carrying myself? How am I behaving? Am I impacting negatively on people or positively? I'll go on to chapter 10, I mean verse 10. How would pray he went on to remind God that these Israelites, they are your servants and your people whom you redeemed by your great strength yeah. and your mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servant who delight in referring your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. In the presence of this man. You know, he said, he, he remembered, he reminded God, he said, listen, God, these are your children, these are your servants, these are your
your children, whom you redeemed. Yes, we remember that you said, if we run, away, we go away from you, we do not listen to you, we disobey you, you will turn your face. And at the same time, you reminded, you told us that if we come back to you, you are faithful to receive us back. So it's reminding God, and he's telling God to please keep me attentive. Attentive to, to my cry, to my be, let your ear hear what I'm saying. If not for anything, for the sake of those who revere you, who obey you, who are still carrying out your work, who, who are still obeying your command for their sake. So now it got to a place where this young man. Remain so sad, remain so disturbed, and I can assure you, for weeks, for months, every day, this young man was crying before the, the throne of God, praying, fasting, and praying. Praying because of his love for God. He cared so much about things that concerned God, not just about himself, because this young man was comfortable, he was very comfortable, he was in a palace. So he had need for nothing, really had nothing to worry about. But he worried about the disgrace of Jerusalem, the disgrace of Jerusalem, the city of his God. The thing that meant so much to God is being belittled, being, you know, treated like rubbish. And that hurt him. And he went, continued to pray. If we go to Nehemiah 2, we can take it from verse 1. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Antaxasis, when wine was brought to, for him, Hezekiah took one and gave it to the king. He said, I had not been sad in his presence before. So the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. Hmm. This, this, is a, this is a worker. It's just one Hebrew child that comes to serve the Lord, the, the, the master, the king, wine. And the king noticed that he wasn't looking comfortable. He, wasn't, he was sad. And he had all the time in the world to say, even to say, ah, what is wrong with you, Lady Maya? You are never like this. You are always a happy going man. Why are you sad? What is the matter? I mean, that tells me that Lady Maya must have been serving diligently. He must have been giving his all in the services for his masters. He must have been a gold, happy, lucky person. He must have been somebody who has given his all to, 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 to his job, so much so that his boss notices the slightest thing that wasn't quite normal about him. So what does that tell us? That tells us that whatever you do, wherever you are working, it does not matter whether you are a cleaner or you are a boss, Keep your all to your service. Because God says you should walk as if whatever you do, you should do it as if you are doing it unto the Lord. Yes. It does not matter whether it is in church or in secular world. Yes. Keep your all. When you give your all, you will receive favor. You will receive grace. And promotion will come with ease. So that is what that passage tells me. So ask yourself, are you giving your all? Are you giving your all? You are serving in the church. Are you committed to your services? What are you doing? What exactly can you say you are doing to, that will impress your boss, that your boss will notice something that is not quite right about you? So the king asked me, why does your face look so sad? When you are not ill, this can be nothing but sadness of heart. Listen to the next sentence. The young man became afraid. Oh my God, the king noticed that I, there's something not quite right with me. He became afraid. Regardless of his fright, he was, able, he was bold enough. He expressed how he felt before the king.
before the king. He said, I was very much afraid. What I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad? May the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins, And his gates have been destroyed by fire. This is boldness. This is boldness. And how did he come about this boldness? He got this boldness through his ancestry, his, his continual communication, his continual study, you know, meditating on the word of God and love for, for his nation, love for his country, love for the things that matter to God. He became very bold. Then the king said to him, what is it that you want? Then, listen here. He said, then I pray to the God of heaven. This reminds me, this tells me that Nehemiah is a man of prayer. Yeah. When the king asked him, he was afraid to start with. Then the king asked him, what is it do you, you want me to do for you? If it was me, I want you to. I need Rolls Royce. Uh, I need a car because my people are suffering. I've been fasting and praying all this time. See on my body, I'm lean. I, I, I think I need to go. You know, treat myself. No, the Himayas said. He prayed. As far as we are concerned, we think we know it all. Before anything, we've taken decisions without consulting with God. Yeah. Even in a place where. He was being asked question. What would you want me to do for you? Through his breath, he was breathing underneath his breath. He was praying underneath his breath. He said, then I pray to God of heaven. And I answer the king. If it pleases the king, if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city of Judah where my ancestors are buried, so I can repair things. Hmm. Hmm. This is my bold. No fear. So you are asking me to send you a way to go and rebuild a city, a place that, uh, you know, oh, what? How dare you? No, but he wasn't. He said, I want to go and rebuild the city. Hmm. Then the queen and the king were sitting together they now ask him, how long will it take? How long will it take? And when will you get back? And of course, he set them a time, how long it will take. Have you got that that will take somebody to trust you enough to release it? Because this guy occupied a very important position. In the palace, yeah. for him to ask to be released was a, a daring thing to start with. Yeah. And then for him now to say, I want to go, and this is how long I will stay. Have you got what it takes for God to trust you? Have you got what it takes to be released? Have you got what it takes? For one to have so much confidence in you and to be so, so, so eager to ensure that you are happy and you are not in a bad mood because of what is going on in your life. Have you got what it takes to be trusted? Have you got what it takes for God to trust a responsibility to you? Have you got what it takes? To say, I am a part of the welfare committee. Can you be trusted to play your role in that capacity? Can I trust you? Yes. And he set a time. I see that wasn't enough. He said to the king, if it pleases you, king, May I have letters to the governor 
May I have letters to the governor of Trans Euphrates so that they will provide me with safe journey, safe transit until I arrive in Judah. I see that wasn't enough. He said, and may I have a letter to Asa, <laughs> keeper of the royal power, so he will give me timber to make beam for the gates of the citadel by the temple. So he now asked, he asked for these things. Well, you've given me, say, you said I should go and build my city, but you know what? There are obstacles on the way. I may not even get here after the first mile or two. I'll probably be, be a dead rat. Please give me a letter of authority so that I can move freely. Okay, I'll give you. And please give me a letter to the very man that keeps the forest to make sure that whatever timber, whatever I need, materials I need for to build the gates, the temple, I want it. Of course, he gave it, the king gave it. And Jeremiah, uh, Nehemiah said here, and because the gracious hand of God was up, upon me, the king granted my request. Because the gracious hand of God is upon me, he granted him his request. How did this come about? Was it an overnight thing? No. It's because it is because Nehemiah has been in, in, in communion, commun communicate, you know, with God all the time. He's in prayer before the Lord God Almighty. He prays, he fasts, he prays for what he feels mattered to him most. That is the things that matter to Jehovah. I see that wasn't enough. Matthew 6, 33, it's principle, played out. Because whatever you do, God says, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and everything will be added unto you. It is true. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and every other thing will be added unto you. Even the things you think you are looking for. I need car. I need this. Oh, my health. Oh, my children. I need that. I need that. But if you seek first the things that matter to God, before you open your mouth to ask, God will bless you with many, many more than you can ever imagine. Listen to this. He said, in, in, in verse 9, part B, the king had also sent army officers and cavalry with me. Nehemiah did not ask for army officers. He did not ask for cavalry. He is a small young man. He, he, he just, you know, all he wanted was passage, letter. Let me get a tree, plant. Let me be able to travel without any interference till I get to where I'm going. But the king went further and gave Nehemiah cavalry and the officers to go with him to where he was going to. Going to uh, verse 11. So he went to Jerusalem and after staying there three days, he set out during the night with a few others. He set out, he went to Jerusalem after three days. I wonder why three days. But he went there after three days. He now decided to go to examine the wall of Jerusalem with other men that were there. And he did not tell them what he wanted to do. He had not told them what God had put in his heart to do for Jerusalem. He had not told them what God had put in his heart to do for Jerusalem. This reminds me of the contrast between Nehemiah and Joseph, whom God told things in his dream, but you know, told his brothers, told people.
people about what he had been told. Without being tactful, out of innocence, he just speak out all of that. But this guy, Nehemiah, very articulate, with great wisdom, he did not tell them anything. But he just went and checked everything. I wonder why he did not tell them. Most likely, if he told, if he told them, if he had told them what his plans, what God had put in his heart, he probably would have been discouraged by the people that who would have been helping, who would have helped to build the city, the city wall. Let's go to verse 17. Verse 17. Then, having gone through the whole place, examined it, he now told them, you see the trouble we are in? You see the whole place. You have examined it. You see how Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Come. Come. Fellow citizens, come. Let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. And we will be we, and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of God on me and what the king had said to me. I told them. So he called them. Have a gone round. Maybe the people that he took round had no idea how bad, how devastated the place was. They were only restricted to their little corner. It's like me in my little corner in Peckham. I don't know anywhere other than Peckham. If I go further, I say, oh, is this place so beautiful? That is how it is. So these people probably had not gone beyond their little environment. So they had no idea how bad the situation was. And he told them, when they had seen it themselves, and when he told them, they now said, oh, yes, we do need to do something. And of course, he now revealed to them what God had placed in his heart and what the king had done. So he now gave them, made them aware of the authority, of the confidence that he had, with which he knew that he was going to build that place, the wall of Jerusalem. And he was sure God was going to be there to help them complete the big task. Wherever there is, you know, whenever you want to do things for God, whenever you want to do anything that will glorify God, the enemy will always surface. The enemy will always surface. Even in your personal life, when you want to do things for yourself, so that the glory of God will, will, will surface, will come upon within your life, Satan, the enemy, will always want to do things to distract you. And of course, there were enemies. There were people like uh, Sambalat, the Veronite, Tobiah, the Ammonites, the officials. They were all, there were people all around Jerusalem, Israel, that did not want the wall to be rebuilt. However, some of them were now accusing him. Are you doing this against the the, 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 the king, oh, you want to take over the place for the, uh, from the king? And, things. and he answered them, saying, The God of heaven will give us success. The God of heaven will give the higher place success. Amen. What is it that you are doing that you know it is for the glory of God and the enemy is? Sowing seeds in your heart to discourage you. Not only in your heart, maybe through words, maybe through friends, and maybe even through some members. What is it you have in your heart to do for the house of God, for the church of the living God, that the enemy is trying to steal away from you? Because no matter what, you cannot do anything for God and not be rewarded. So when you are doing things and the enemy knows it is for God and try to distract you, are you
you giving the enemy the chance to, be, to, to distract you? May that not be our portion in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, now, he answered him, saying, God of heaven will give us success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding. This is a leader who knew, who knows what he's doing and what he's saying. And he knows the God that he's serving. And he knows the God he's been praying for day and night. And he said, but as for you, that's those that were against him, building the place, the enemies of the Israelites, Sabalat, Tobias, Geshem, he said to them, as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim on history right to this. May we have share, O oh Lord, and claim to the kingdom of God. May our work be so, 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 so precious. May we walk in, in a manner in such a way that we can even say categorically, God, I have given my all. Remember me for what I have done. Remember me for the seed I have sown in your church. Remember me for the services I have been given, that I'm giving in your church. May God be, may God help us that we may have an opportunity to say, yes, we are partaker of the kingdom of God when it is fully established. So now, what my, 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 my real topic here is standing for what matters. Standing for what matters. Stand for what matters. Stand for what matters. We, every day when we go to pray, we do not even think about God. We do not ask about, we don't even ask him what he needs from us. All we do is ask, God, bless me. I am number one in this. God, bless me. God, I need money. God, I need that. God, I need a new car. God, oh, my children. Oh, God. Have you thought about things that God needs? Have you thought about the needs of God? You are always thinking about your own comfort. What about the comfort, the things that matter to God? Nehemiah knew what mattered to God? May they might have knew how important Jerusalem is to God. We are admonished that we should pray for the peace of Jerusalem. How many of us really in our spare time have thought about praying for the peace of Jerusalem? Speaker, how often have you really prayed for the peace of Jerusalem? May God help us in this wise in Jesus' name. Amen. So, what is important to God. If you stand for what matters to God, God will stand for everything that matters to you. Because before you knew you needed anything, God has already known it. He will make it available to you. He will make it available to you. So what has God placed in your heart today? What has God placed in your heart today? Has God placed in your heart to be a part of a ministry, to be a part of a church, to be a part of evangelizing, to win souls to God? Has God placed in your heart how to go and reach out to non-believers? Has God placed in your heart to set people who are in captives in, in captive, in one shape or the other, to set them free, to come to the knowledge of Christ Jesus, have you? How have you gone about meeting these needs? How have you gone about meeting these needs? You know, whatever is placed in your heart, if God has placed something in your heart, do not hesitate to do it. 
Do not delay in doing it. Once God places something in your heart, the enemy will come and will try to take that thing out of your heart. But somebody will ask me, how can I know when God has placed something in my heart? How do I know when God has placed something in my heart to do for me or for my neighbor or for my friends or for members of the church? How do I know? God speaks to us in various ways. It could be through dreams. God will speak to you through dreams. The other day, one of our mom came and told us about the dream she had, about the church. So God spoke to her through that dream. And we got to the message. And it could be through the sermon that we hear every day, every Sunday in church, or during life group. It could be through your, 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 your study of the Bible. And it could be through God, your, your, your thoughts that comes to you. Oh, uh, this sister, uh, I think she needs this. Oh, this brother, I think she needs that. Oh, the church, I think we should create something that will enable people who are not doing well to succeed. There was a young sister here some months ago who gave us an idea about food bank that was a thought he, she thought about it and that was God who ministered you know, that ministered to, to her that we can help people in the community who are less privileged by giving out food at the end of every month or by you know so God can speak through you to you through your thoughts through dreams through the sermons you hear. So what is God telling you? What has God put in your spirit? What has God put in you? And whatever God has put in you, or whatever you are thinking about, are you ready? Will you avail yourself to accomplish this goal? Will you be prepared, come rain, come sunshine, to meet this goes. May God help us. What is your wall of Jerusalem? Nehemiah built the wall, rebuilt the wall of Jerusalem. What is your wall of Jerusalem? What is my wall of Jerusalem? Your wall of Jerusalem could be your addiction. Your wall of Jerusalem could be your greed. Your wall of Jerusalem could be your unforgiveness. Your wall of Jerusalem could be, you know, smoking cigarettes. Your wall of Jerusalem could be a nonchalant attitude. Your wall of Jerusalem could be, hmm, okay, I'm comfortable, so whatever happens to that does not matter to me. Your wall of Jerusalem could be anything. I challenge you today, no matter what your wall of Jerusalem is, Ask God. Go to God in prayer. Seek the face of God. Read the word concerning your wall of Jerusalem. Pray concerning your wall of Jerusalem. Pray, meditate, and ask God to send help to you. Because sometimes you cannot manage this yourself. You need to seek help. Thank God. If your wall of Jerusalem is so devastated, God will make people available to you. Even will make kings available to you. Will make kings provide for you the things you have not asked for. As long as you are prepared, you have in your heart that this wall of Jerusalem, because our body, we are the temple of God. And the wall of Jerusalem inside of us cannot be in rain. Because the wall of Jerusalem inside of us, if they remain in rain, then the, 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 we, the, the disgrace, the shame, because you, as a child of God, people should look at you and see the glory of God shining yeah. upon us. So if, as a child of God, the wall of Jerusalem in you is devastated, is ruined, is broken. 
then you must do something to rebuild it. May God give us the grace to rebuild every wall of Jerusalem in our lives. In the name of Jesus. May God give us the grace to rebuild every wall of Jerusalem in the church. There are a lot of walls of Jerusalem that are in ruin out there. There are churches which you respect that are going about false prophets making prophecies paying people money so that they can prophesy for them it is so sad i saw one a few days ago where a prophet so-called false prophet was found caught paying somebody money five naira five thousand naira so in order for him to prophesy prophesying all manner of lies these are people who are breaking, who are ruined, who are ruining the walls of Jerusalem. And God will help us that we will, we will rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. We will remove everything that God has not planted and not allowed, does not allow in the wall of Jerusalem. So we will go out and we will rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. Let every wall of Jerusalem in our life that does not glorify God be broken, Amen. be rebuilt Amen. in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. What is the wall of Jerusalem? What is the wall of Jerusalem in your life? Go. Go. Seek the face of God. Go. Pray. Go. Ask God to help you. Ask God to help you. As long as it is for his glory, as long as it is because you want to glorify him, you don't want people to make a mockery of your God. You don't want people to laugh at your God. Because at time people will say, where is this God that you are serving? Look at you. There is nothing about you that tells me that you are a Christian. God, may we not have anything that would make people make a mockery of us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now, you need to set a time. How will I identify your wall of Jerusalem? How will I identify your wall of Jerusalem? You need to, to set a time. So go out and pray. Go out and do what you need to do. Unfortunately, I have taken so much of your time. I appreciate that. So I will want to stop here. But the takeaway of this message is, the takeaway of this message. The takeaway of this message are these. Nehemiah had no compromise. Nehemiah had no compromise. His general attitude to life was uncompromising. Yeah. When it came to things of God, his fear of God, faithfulness, love, passion, never knowingly grudging, nor weary anything. He was passionate. He was not compromising. Nehemiah was prayerful. His love for God meant he studied and meditated on the word of God and communed regularly with God. Thereby developed a great personal relationship with God and man. Nehemiah was a go-getter. Nehemiah identified what God had placed in his heart. He went all out believing that God will accomplish what he has started in his life. Let every, my prayer is that everything God has planted, has started in your life, will be fruition in Jesus' name. Amen. At this point, I would like us to rise because I've taken so much of your time. I would like us to rise and say a few prayers. Father, we thank you. There are a lot more that we have talked about. But thank you for the word we have heard. Thank you, Lord. My prayer today, O oh Lord, as in Jeremiah 1.6, as he confessed the sins of himself and his father, so I would like us to confess our sins and the sins of the church and the sins of our fathers. That God should forgive us. I would like us to pray for God's forgiveness for being only interested in things that matters to us and not things that matter to God.
that God should change our, our, our thoughts, our actions, change our story so that we can think about him first before our own. I would like us to pray for a willing spirit to serve the Lord, to serve in the house of God, to serve not only in the house of God, even outside the church, so that people can come to know God through God. Let us pray.